So it's become a bit of a tradition that each new Star Trek show introduces a new alien race, whether it's the iconic Romulans and Klingons that were introduced in original series, the comedic Ferengi that were introduced in Next Generation, or the menacing yet underexplored Dominion in Deep Space Nine. Every Star Trek series leaves a mark on the franchise by introducing new and interesting alien races. That being said, no one expected Enterprise to do that because Enterprise was a prequel, and so the fandom was somewhat blindsided when Enterprise introduced us to the Zindi. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today, yes, I am here to talk to you about the Zindi. This was requested by Navark Tully DT. My objective in this video is to evaluate just how powerful the Zindi were or maybe weren't in both the expanse and the wider galaxy of the 22nd century. So let's just jump into it. So firstly, I want to make some preliminary remarks. Firstly, of course, we all know that, that the Zindi are a multi-species alliance. In fact, they all evolved on the same planet, and this is incredibly exceptional. Zindus must be a very, very large planet with very diverse biospheres and plenty of natural resources in order to sustain the development of multiple sentient species. I have my own quibbles with that, but in any case, it's a very unique planet in a unique environment. But more to the point, the Zindi evolved in a closed system, that being the closed system of the expanse, where few people come in and no one leaves. And so that puts them in a very interesting space where it's actually quite hard to gauge how powerful they are as a nation, as a people, in the 22nd century compared to the other powers of the period, such as the Vulcans or Andorians. And then another interesting factor with the Zindi is that we have a diverse array of technology because we have five different species all developing their own technology and with their own specializations. And we also then have the input of non-native technology from the sphere builders, which is again a whole separate kettle of fish as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Zindi fleet. And actually the first thing I want to mention about the Zindi fleet is, well, the elephant in the room, the Zindi weapon. The Zindi weapon, in and of itself, tells us a lot about the fleet. Because if the Zindi had a very large and powerful star fleet, they wouldn't need the weapon. There's clearly two deficiencies that the weapon is there to compensate for. A lack of large-scale firepower and a lack of range. If the Zindi had a fleet that was both capable of reaching Earth and powerful enough to obliterate the planet, and granted, we are talking... 22nd century technology, but if they had that, then surely they would have used that. The fact that they went to the trouble of developing and building the weapon tells us that actually the Zindi fleet is probably quite small and not really capable of the large-scale campaign that would be necessitated in order to destroy humanity. So that's why they built the weapon, is because of those deficiencies of firepower and range that exist in their fleet. Now, obviously, the other thing to mention with the Zindi fleet is that it's got a very uh, diverse array of technology, very different capabilities are on display, but also that there's no real unified doctrine. Now, you won't see doctrine all that much in the 22nd century, because most people don't have fleets large enough to warrant sophisticated, coherent doctrines. So maybe that's partially the case for the Zindi, but equally another reason why they don't have a unified doctrine is because the Zindi themselves aren't unified. <laughs> so they can't really build ships towards a coherent military purpose, they just kind of have to work with whatever they themselves have to hand. Of course, ideally, they're going to act in a concerted, united fashion, but I think oftentimes most of the Zindi species are just going to be looking out for themselves. So the first faction I'm going to look at is perhaps the most important when it comes to shipbuilding, and that's the insectoids, because we have a lot of insectoid ships to talk about. You have the main insectoid ship, the 
It's obviously quite light. It's much weaker than the, even the reptilian ship, which, as we'll see, is not the most durable thing in the world. Um, it's very agile, though. Very agile, very maneuverable. And it's relatively aggressively armed. It can be armed with either beam weapons or pulse weapons. The effects in Enterprise Season 3 are super inconsistent. So sometimes they'll fire green energy beams. And other times they'll fire blue beams. And then other times they'll even fire blue pulses. So make of that what you will. I don't think the Zindi Insectoid ship has a torpedo launcher. In fact, I don't know if the Zindi have invested at all in torpedo technology. Uh, the the uh, nature of the Expanse actually probably makes torpedoes a not particularly useful weapon to have. Not to mention the fact that the Zindi subspace vortex technology also partially alleviates that need. But this is not the only insectoid ship. We see the insectoid scout, which is much smaller and even flimsier. Very, very flimsy. And then that's not even the last one we see. We also see Degra's ship, which is very clearly an insectoid ship, Degra's barge. It's a very, very fast, relatively well-protected courier ship. That's not even the end of it. You also have the insectoid shuttle, which is more of a combat assault shuttle, where they're building the weapon on Azati Prime. They also have submersibles as well. So, all told, these Indian sectoids seem to have quite a lot of ships. So now let's move on to some of the other species. Uh, the most iconic Zindi ship is, of course, the Reptilian Cruiser. This is actually slightly weaker than an NX class, and we see it struggle in one-on-ones. In two-on-ones, yeah, it's got the advantage, but even then, these are pretty lightly armoured ships, um, compared to the NX, their main strength seems to be, again, in agility and in their firepower. The Reptilians also seem very, very keen on using boarding actions. Again, possibly indicating that they're not particularly confident in their own ships. It's a relatively light build, but it does carry torpedoes. It seems relatively rare, and the only ship that we see use it is Commander Dolem's flagship, so possibly... They can have torpedoes, but I think, ultimately, it's not the most commonly used weapon by the Zindi. Uh, another note that I would say, again, is that actually, looking at the design language, it would not surprise me if this ship was also built by the Insectoids. And actually, in that same vein, let's talk about the Primate ship. It's a very nice ship, very elegant, very sleek, still kind of somewhat aggressive with that sort of bladed look. Again, looking at that and then comparing it to the insectoid ships, it seems to have a lot in common. And, you know, you say, oh, well, they're all Zindi ships. Well, yes, but equally they seem to have a lot more in common with the insectoid ships than they do other Zindi ships, as we'll get on to. I'm actually going to propose the theory that both the reptilians and primates actually get their ships built by the insectoids. The primate ship from what we can see it's moderately powerful it's not awful it's not the arboreal ship but it seems like a general purpose generic merchantman starship it's not particularly heavily armed but it's not awful now let's get on to the more interesting ships first let's talk about the arboreal ship this is of course a reuse of the arcorian warship from an episode that no one remembers so, this is one of these ships where it probably is just a bought from a third party, and it makes some sense. If the Arboreal saw that the other Zindi races were getting their ships built by the Insectoids, their only alternative would be to get the Aquatics to build their ships for them. But, there's a problem, and, and that's that you would polarise the Zindi. You would create a divide between the Reptilians, Primates, and Insectoids, and the Arboreals and the Aquatics, and they would sort of split apart. Rather than create a potential split in the Zindi Council, the Arboreals instead decide to just buy in a foreign design. Now, whether this ship was built by the Arcorians or the Tellarites, who knows? Finally, and I've saved the best and the biggest to last, we've got the Aquatic Dreadnought. 
This thing is huge. Something in the range of 2,000 meters long. The Zindi aquatic ship is very, very big, very, very slow, and very, very tanky. It's a very defensive design compared to the other sort of Zindi ships, which are very much glass cannons. And possibly it was designed to complement the other ships. We see that it does have a capacity to carry the, the NX class in an internal hangar bay. And actually, the NX is a lot bigger than most of the other Zindi ships. So maybe it could even carry multiple smaller Zindi ships. But it definitely seems very different from the other Zindi races and certainly is the most impressive out of all of them. So, as I say, what this really tells us is that the Insectoids are the primary shipbuilders of the Zindi, and if you want anything that is fast, the Insectoids have you covered. The Reptilians, from what we can tell, have only one ship, and seem to emphasise Marines. We also can tell from various council meetings, that the reptilians are very interested in biological warfare, and possibly this is reflective of their own natural immunity. The reptilians will be somewhat blasé about cultivating dangerous pathogens because, well, they're reptiles. They have some of the best immunities out there. The aquatics very clearly, not just from what we see of their ships, but again from what we see of the construction of the weapon on Azati Prime, have the largest facilities, and that makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, it's easier to build things underwater, particularly if you're well adapted to it. It's got a lot of the benefits of building in vacuum, i.e. reduced mass, without having to worry about getting stuff up to orbit. You can build stuff on the planet without worrying about it being too heavy and then blast it up to orbit as a complete product. And it's a lot easier to establish as well. You don't need to build a big orbital station to have a infrastructure to build a large construct like the Zindi weapon. It's also very concealable. So again, a large shipyard or similar industrial facilities in orbit or on the surface of a planet are going to be very visible. But underwater, they're far harder to detect. And again, if you're trying to keep a low profile, as it seems like the Zindi are a lot of the time, that's very handy. In fact, the industrial infrastructure of the aquatics very much reminds me of the Mon Calamari from Star Wars. We, we also see that the, uh, the arboreals and the primates place far less emphasis on their ships. They seem to really have them as a bit of an afterthought. They're from getting to A to B, frankly. So, with that all said and done, let's take a closer look at the Zindi economy because now we have the tools we need to answer several questions and make several educated guesses as what the Zindi economy is based around and what the various specializations are within that economy. So, for the Zindi reptilians, they probably have a lot of economic advantages in terms of biotech. As I mentioned previously, Zindi reptilians are themselves very immune, and so they are really best positioned to, to be developing, I mean, all sorts of biotech, not just bioweapons, I'm sure they develop medicine and various uh, drugs, again, export those across the expanse. They also clearly uh, are investing in organic technologies, we know that their weapons are partially organic, and perhaps they also provide the organic components for other Zindi vessels, and they also probably are in charge of uh, weapons development. I would also speculate that given the resilience of Zindi reptilians, that they do most of the hard labor, most things like resource uh, extraction and manufacturing and stuff like that. Any, you know, tough blue collar work, reptilians are going to be your guys. Now we get to the insectoids, and the insectoids seem to have a big, big slice of the pie when it comes to shipbuilding. They seem to be, by, by numbers, the biggest shipbuilders out of the entire Zindi Alliance. It's worth saying that actually part of the reason why Degra bought into Archer's deception in the episode Stratagem is because he knew that the Insectoids did have the industrial infrastructure to build a large fleet. So it just adds credence to the idea that the main economic output of these Zindi Insectoids 
is starships. The other thing would be computer parts. Their insectoid brains were perhaps would be perhaps quite well wired to develop computer parts. Then we get to the arboreals. The arboreals seem to demonstrate a specialization in various forms of high technology, including sophisticated ore refinement, probably power generation as well. Uh, it's also likely, given how the arboreals dress, that they also produce fine goods as well for export. Similarly, the primates seem interested, from what we can tell in Degra, the primates seem to be relatively au fait with emergent technologies and incorporating those things into their pre-existing systems, bearing in mind, of course, they're receiving technology from the sphere builders, and perhaps the primates are the best positioned for integrating that into, you know, Zindi society at large. And I would also speculate that the primates are the leaders really in trade and finance. Again, no one really remarks that Degra's ship is an insectoid ship and we see that it's a good little cargo courier, so perhaps it's actually quite widely employed as a fast uh, merchantman, as a, as a, a tea clipper, if you will. Finally, we get to the aquatics, who seem to be absolutely dominant in heavy industry and engineering, and also probably because of the, how sophisticated they are as a language, probably in computer programming as well. So that's really how the Zindi economy works. As you can see, it's a very complex and interconnected system, um, and in the expanse, they would probably be quite significant. So... Really, to sum it all up, while the Zindi are militarily significant in the Expanse, and by no means are they the only military in the Expanse, but they do seem to be the preeminent military power in the Expanse, and granted, that's not necessarily saying that much. They have clearly mastered control of their local space, and, you know, are perfectly capable of just jumping on a ship out of nowhere. Again, that's where that whole subspace vortex technology comes in. It's a very useful bit of tech and allows the Zindi to strike at will in the Expanse, while also bypassing a lot of the uh, dangers of the Expanse as well. But when we then put the Zindi in the wider context of the Alpha Quadrant of the 22nd century, we find them wanting. We see that Shran is easily capable of destroying a reptilian warship. The Kamari pretty easily destroys uh, Commander Dolem's flagship, and that's their main ship of the line. And it just gets completely swatted by a Kumari class. Possibly we're looking at a better matchup when we start throwing the Aquatics into the mix. But the Aquatics are not going to have that many ships. And I probably would actually say that an Aquatic cruiser would probably struggle in a two-on-one with the Vulcan Dakia. I don't think it's really quite up to the, the wider standard of the of the Alpha Quadrant of the 22nd century. Uh, the Zindi are in a very closed system. Again, they're, they're missing very key technologies like warp drive and, well, any kind of torpedo weapon, barring a few exceptional cases. Uh, their use of transporters also seems to be, again, very inconsistent. The only time we see the reptilians, the Zindi, use a transporter is to beam Hoshi aboard their ship. But that's it. The rest of the time, they have to board the old-fashioned way. So that tells us that the Zindi are far behind compared to the rest of the quadrant in several key areas, which is very interesting to think about. However, when we start talking about economics, the Zindi position actually looks a lot better. The Zindi do have some very big economic advantages in shipbuilding, in advanced technology, and in heavy engineering. But these are not things that are going to take the Zindi all the way up to being a superpower or a major power of the period. The Zindi in the Expanse would be classed as a micropower. They're extremely dominant in their local area. But in the wider space of the 22nd century, they're a second-rate power at best. So, thank you guys for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Which is your favourite Zindi ship, actually? That would be an interesting one to know. Let me know in the comments below. And I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members. My Navarx. Jeffrey Ballard. Tully DT. Rella. And David Reeves. My Commanders. Captain's Quarters. 
Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Bird Monster, Jeff Hallam, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Narata, Dasplas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, Nicholas Walsh, and Tom Zaros. And I salute my centurions, Pendleberry, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, John Nicole, Athy's Collection, and Tobias Klein. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.